Hello, hello, everybody. My name is Hiya Salma. I'm a somatic movement uh, educator and a speaker and an author. And thank you so much, everybody, for coming to watch this video and for subscribing and leaving us comments and likes also for this video. And it is a special, special honor to welcome to this space a fellow movement magic maker and a psychotherapist and a specialist in eating disorders and in grief and many, many other important healing aspects. Lori Lynn Meter, thank you so much for coming. We have known each other for many years. Yes, um, yeah. Yes, I'm now in Paris, but I used to live in New York. And Lori Lynn and I, we dance together and we talk together. And she's a graceful mover. And I just uh, deeply honor your work. Lori Lynn, tell us something about, as I said in my brief introduction, your background and your work is so fascinating because you do somatic therapeutic movement uh, as, a, as an educator, as a practitioner also. And then your practice as a psychotherapist, tell us about how you discovered both and how they exist in your life and anything else you want to start us out with. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. I, I can say, dear friend. All right, what can I say? Um, as many have said, perhaps many have felt and, and have known to be true, I've been dancing, moving since I can remember. Um, and when I was younger, I loved to move. I was always that zany, goofy kid. And my folks channeled it into dance classes. And I enjoyed jazz and tap throughout the years. And, and then I went into aerobics teaching. And I had all these different moments or, or, or times in my life where movement was at the, at the center of things. And yet it was in some ways, even in my former life, I actually have another whole career, which was that I was a performer in musical theater. And so, you know, getting to sing and dance on a stage, all of these ways, I mean, they were so, I'm so lucky to have called that my job, my first career, but they were very presentational. You know, it was very, and that, that was really fun and, and quite gratifying. And what I found through the years, and I really found a different way of moving. And I went to uh, back to school for my master's degree for the path of psychotherapy. I found, um, I love your word, magic in the movement. I found a more internal, a more introspective, a more, whether it was through authentic movement or Nia or groove, um, I have found ways to move that aren't as for everyone else, but they're for me. Whether I'm a student in someone's class or I'm teaching a class. And the same thing is true for being a therapist. I mean, I went from being in front of perhaps thousands of people and, and having just a good old time to being in a room with one person, the door is closed and it's really a, a, a beautiful duet mm -hmm. uh, that, that nobody else gets to see. And so I found, I'll say this, I found my way to wanting to go down the road of becoming a psychotherapist um, I feel like it found me. Mm. I feel like it was the beginning really of me deciding to be on my own personal growth journey. Mm. When I got into therapy, it was when I started to learn more about myself. And as I was doing that, and as I was learning how to be a therapist, I also began moving differently. Hmm. Oh, okay. I need to ask some questions right away. Was that this is so fascinating? Was that switch from being a performer, doing uh, choreographic movements that were created by somebody else, from there to finding these therapeutic somatic practices? 
you said that it helped you discover this inner dimension and you started to move differently, but was it also somehow, was there a healing that happened to you during that time also? That's one question. Was it a healing journey also for a performer on the stage to do something that is somatic? And the second question is, mm, wait, what was the second question? The second question is, I forget the second question. I'll ask you this later. <laughs> so let me see if I got your question. Um, healing, I want to say really both. Both ways of being in my body and in the world and moving. Um, I'll say it this way. Musical theater was healing with a small age. Oh. You know, being on stage and being able to entertain and being able to share through this instrument called my body. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. It, it was, I didn't think it ever got better than that. Mm -hmm. Yet capital H healing, really tuning in and it being about what does my body ask? What does my body need? What is an emotion that might be in there that's just longing to come forth? And so that's been a different way that I've inhabited my body and and enjoyed my movement practice. Mm. So that answer the question? Yes, I remember now the second question also. You said that you started to move differently. Can you describe to us, well, how did your movements change? Or show us. I can show, I mean, it's here up, but um, I'll, I'll say something first. And then if I need to show, I will. I felt if, if, I don't know if this is true. I'm going to say it and then I'll see if it feels true because that's I'm an external processor. So I need to say it out loud. In a way, I felt wonderfully two dimensional. So it felt very, you know, and not at all choreography is here, but it felt, you know, for you out there. And I'm going to light up the moment with, with, and I keep doing jazz hand, right? That's kind of the classic musical kind of. And as my movement changed, it almost felt more three-dimensional. And I don't just mean that there wouldn't necessarily even be a front of the room, but internally it felt more dimensional. It could be quieter. It changed in my subtlety. It could be the dance of a few fingers or the dance of the base of my skull that I might not have had an opportunity to move in somebody else's choreography. I love the way you said that earlier. Oh, that's great. I think we got the the viewers. I think we got a sense of all a sense of the movements also, uh, how they, maybe they became more fluid. And yes, I love the idea of uh, the inner world becoming more multi-dimensional also. Right. Now, Lorelin, we're here actually to talk about stress. Yeah. How do we start this conversation about <laughs> body and movement? Maybe one way to start it is, well, what do you think stress is? Like, how do you somehow see this term and how do you define it or how do you approach it? Or do you like it? Do you dislike it? The term, I mean, the word. I love it. I love it. I love all of these wonderings. Okay, I have I have a few words that I call my favorites and I put them in air quotes intentionally. So stress is one of my favorites. And that means it's the one when it comes forward, whether it's somebody coming into a movement class or somebody coming in for their session in psychotherapy. Um, I, I will always do my best to go a little further with it. So other words, and I, we can play with this later, but words like fine. Words like stubborn, words like restless. With stress, I often hear things like I feel overwhelmed or, well, where I feel it in my body is I feel tense. Yes, yes, and yes to all of the above, right? And often when I hear the word stress, I let myself ground so that I can, like, I'm ready. Okay, here comes the stress conversation. Life is stressful. Mm -hmm. Lots of things bring on something that is very real in the body, right? Our hearts race. We might sweat. 
we feel jittery, we can't think straight, we start to go very fast. And often when I hear somebody say, I feel stressed, I let them tell me about it first. Mm -hmm. It feels important. Give me the context in which you're feeling stressed. Then I say, well, what if we looked at stress as like a, a doorway? So it's like the stress is the door frame. Maybe it's the door itself. Maybe it's the doorknob. And what if we open it? Mm -hmm. Could you tell me, and maybe I could come up with an example, um, what's underneath or inside or in the tender underbelly of this word stress? So if somebody's talking to me about some big meeting that they're going to have with their boss and they're really stressed about it, they don't know where it's going to go. They don't know if they're getting a promotion or getting fired or somewhere in between. And I'll say, if you could put this into an emotion. Hmm. And I don't claim to know what the emotion or emotions might be, but often lurking in some nearby place is fear, anger, grief, um, all kinds of emotions that take us further into helping the stress transform. Let me just stop there and hear that echo in the room and let's see where we want to go from there. So what does stress mean to me? Back to your beautiful overarching question. It means come on in, stress is our entry point and there's so much more, so many more places we can go with it. Yes. <clears throat> Let's assume I'm your client. I come to you. I'm your psychotherapy client. I say, I come to you. I say, I'm so stressed. I feel this and this and this and this in my body. Mm. What do you do? The very, very first thing I ask is, would it be okay if we do our best to slow down even just a little bit? I'm often met with, but I can't, there's so much more. Can you just let me get it all out? And can I, and I'll say, I want to hear every word, mm -hmm. but I don't think you want me to run as fast as you. I would like to invite you into our imaginary, onto our imaginary bench where we can get cozy. And I want to learn about what's stressing you out. And often say it at this pace, quite intentionally, hoping that the mirror neurons are helping the person even go from a 10 to a nine and a half, right? I'll take, and then I might say, so the, this story you're carrying, what's stressing you out, this is very real. You can feel it in your body, right? Can you describe it to me? So can we role play a little bit? Okay. Well, yeah, well, how do you feel this, if you do at all, inside? Or is it just a story here? I feel this as a nervousness, as a tingling in my belly. Mm -hmm. I feel this as a, as a shortness of breath. I feel my stress as um, a weight on my brain, on my mind. I feel the stress as a, I feel it in many ways, actually. That was so beautifully, colorfully described. Okay, um, tingling in your belly. Shortness of breath, weight on your brain or your mind or your head. I'm going to go with the second one first and then go to the other two. Mm -hmm. I rarely, if ever, say to somebody, let's see if we can take a deep breath. Oh, yeah. Now, wouldn't that be a good thing to do? 
Right. What Maybe. I have found, right. What I have found over the years is sometimes when somebody takes a couple of deep breaths, things escalate. So I never want to claim it's like not it's not one stop shopping. It's not like one size fits all. So I love the second, the first thing you said, which was jittering and jittery in my belly, tingling in my belly. Would it be okay if we just say hello to that tingling? Yeah. I might be met with, why would I wanna do that? Well, don't I wanna get rid of the stress? Why do I wanna say hello to it? And I like to think of anything that's trying to get our attention as that beautiful little kid, like almost like tugging at our, our sleeve. Lori Lynn, Lori Lynn, Lori Lynn, Lori Lynn. And I say, oh, what is it? And oftentimes the feeling, the tingling might say or feel, oh, she's paying attention to me. Mm -hmm. Now I can really tell her what it's all about. So the very first thing I like to do is say hello to whatever sensation shows up. Mm -hmm. Heaviness on your head. Ah, oh, can you paint that picture? It, what is it? What does it look like? What is the heaviness on your head? So what, what might you say? I might say heaviness in my head feels like, <clears throat> it feels like my thoughts don't have the same kind of fluidity that they have usually. It feels like darkness. It feels like being in a tunnel. It feels like my tongue is heavy. It feels like the, the, the back of the neck is like pulsating. It just feels also like the, 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 the there's a little, what is it called? Um, the head is like in the clouds a little bit. But yeah, a little way. floating, a little That's foggy. Foggy. Yeah. Whoa. So the first thing I say with foggy and floating is, can you feel your feet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Yeah. And are they barefoot? Are they in socks or slippers or shoes? Can you wiggle your toes? Yeah, I can do that. Pushing them against the, the floor. Mm -hmm. And now can you feel your back, lower back or your backside in your chair? Good. Can you can you remember what day it is? I take foggy and fuzzy floating very seriously. That typically means I'm not all here. My stress just started to take me away. Mm -hmm. And I want to work with all of you. So I want to see if it's okay for all of you to be here. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we forget about where we were and we're in our feet, we're in our chair. And now we return. Whoa, there's a lot going on in, in and around your head. That sounds pretty awful. So I want to let that part know that I'm not going to try to make it okay because I'm not that magical. Mm -hmm. And this thing we're calling stress, as we can feel, right? It's got these tentacles that just go further and deeper. They're in the body. They're in our emotions. And where are our emotions? In our bodies. Typically throat, chest, and belly. Our emotions aren't really here. Mm -hmm. That's where uh, I think it was um, Allison, you were interviewing Allison, a great interview. Uh, I'm gonna say something about your interviews in a minute, my dear, but um, she was saying story, right? We, we want to tell our story. So all of these sensations are connected to something. And I'm guessing you don't want to feel that foggy, floaty, dark, heavy, but it's here for a reason. And we want to get to know it so it can talk to us. Mm -hmm. I love this. So you're guiding us to go toward the sensations and toward the things that we typically wouldn't, I, I, I don't want to feel these things. And so you're asking us to pause, to notice, to name them and to listen to them and to maybe at some point transform them also. 
So when I, when I hear you speak, I really see how, how you pay a lot of attention. You place a lot of value on the importance of physical sensations in, in your work when you work uh, as, as a psychotherapist. That's right. Really work and, with the body. That's right. And what's amazing in terms of how my work has changed mm -hmm. since 2020, I do work in person, but I do a lot of work on Zoom. And as you can see with both you and me, I'm tracking basically from your heart up, mm -hmm. maybe arms, shoulders, throat, muscles in your face, the way you sit, the way you come forward or the way that I do as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so I might not be able to see your hands, but I will often use my hands and bring them into the frame. It's so different than when we could sit in the same room together. So as a movement practitioner, I'm inviting more emotion. It really enhances and changes the dance. As a psychotherapist, I'm really inviting the body to talk to us and teach us because that's where it lives. The body's faster than our words. And do you find that there's resistance when it comes to yes. this, the part of the... Why? And then I lean into that. Okay. Oh, there's a part that's saying, no way. I came to you to feel better. Why are you asking me to move for closer to the stress? And I say, whoa, let's, I, I, we don't need to jump into the deep end. Mm -hmm. Let's learn from this great protector of yours. Mm -hmm. That part's there for a good reason too. And I want to get to know that. And so how do I feel better after all this? So I name, I name my, my sensations. I look at them. We feel them. We talk to them. When do I start feeling better? What do you I need? You just to said the key little piece, but you said it really quickly. And so I'm going to slow it down. You just said that so beautifully. So when we feel it in our bodies and we say hello, it's like, I, I um, liken it to, this is a way that I work called the focusing technique. It was uh, created by a man who's no longer with us. His name's Eugene Genlin. And it's really about tracking the body, not even knowing what the emotion might be. You called it tingling. Mm -hmm. I don't go in and say, what are you feeling in your belly? Mm -hmm. Say, tell me about the tingle. Can we say hello? And when we hang out with it, does it get louder? Does it get softer? Does it stay exactly the same? Does it change? And yeah, and that's kind of like tingling, but a slower tingle. Okay, it's slower. Hello, slower tingle. So I stay with the body sensations. And then I might say, if this tingling had a mood or an emotion, what might it be if you could feel into that? Oh, I can feel that it's, yeah, when, what I was calling stress, I feel afraid. Oh, and as I see that you're afraid, I see that you're not really exhaling. Is it really breathing? Okay, so if we stayed with afraid, what does afraid want us to know? So this was the piece that you said really quickly. It's like, how can I help someone feel something and ride the wave and come back on the other side of the feeling? In other words, feel the fear in its completion. It might be tied to history. It might be just in the presence of perhaps this scary boss that the person might have and but it's probably connected to something that threatens safety or security or comfort or peace. And when a feeling is felt in its entirety, often what we hear is, well, I understand that my boss is the same person, but the fear feels different. Oh, tell me what it feels like now. 
well, I feel like a little bit afraid, but I feel like, like a lightness and a brightness around it or a confidence or like a, like my chest feels a little expansive. And then I would stay with that and expand and, you know, uh, emphasize that because now there's like glimmers of strength. Mm. And it is something that I did want to uh, say something more about in listening to some of your other interviews. Is it okay that I go on or would you like to stop? Okay. No, no, go ahead. How do we feel better? That's your good question. If we ride that wave of emotion in its entirety, that's not easy to do if we just stay with the stress story right? We get under it and it's like, oh, I actually feel sad about the, ah, now we've got an emotion. We don't have to let go of anything. We don't have to let go of the fear or let go of the stress. It lets go of us. It integrates in our bodies. So over on that side of that beautiful wave is, well, yeah, it's kind of there, but it has a different quality now. And I don't feel so afraid. And I didn't have to, or me as the feeler of all that, I didn't have to do any, I didn't have to take any action in trying to let something go. I personally have trouble with the phrase, let it go. I know, I know I heard you on other interviews and I was feeling you. I was like, what does this word even mean? And how do we deal with it? I have, I have a lot of troubles with this word. And so that's why I wrote an article about this and did this interviews about this. And exactly, so. because how do I let it go? Where does it go? For me, it's like a tapestry. And it's like the thing that I wasn't able to fully feel is like a dangling thread. And when I can really feel it, the thread integrates back into the tapestry and it gets woven in. And I've done the beautiful work of just allowing myself to feel it. Does that make sense? Wait a second, now I don't understand. Okay. So let's assume, for example, that the emotion that I feel, the, the story that I described to you somehow is evoking the, the feeling of fear. And so I feel this fear and so, uh, how do, how does the fear, how do I integrate? Are you saying that I, I integrate the fear somehow back into my system? And so therefore I'm lost. You're not lost. Mm -hmm. I think the reason it's not easy to mm, understand this is that we're really doing our best to do it from our intellect. Mm -hmm. And what I'm describing to you is actually an experiential in the body moment. So in the moment with me, if you were my client, and I'm not going to ask you to do this now, but I would ask you, so talk to me, tell me, what's the scariest thing about this? And then you would probably start talking and I would ask you to slow down. And I might ask you, where are you feeling this? And is it okay to put a hand there? Again, we're all converging, people you're interviewing. So many of us are saying some of the same things. That's good. And I know. And in the moment, you're feeling fear. And I'm riding it with you until it, in a very natural way, you don't have to do anything you get to the other side, almost like the arc of the story. It's like, and then my boss did this. And I was so, I actually felt threatened in the room with her and I, I couldn't breathe. And I, and tell me, tell me, what did you, what, what did your body want to do? Did you want to flee? Were you frozen? Were you, yeah, I was kind of frozen. I forgot. Oh my gosh, that sounds so awful. Can you imagine this is the other big piece can you imagine me right there with you? So that in that moment with your boss, you're not by yourself. What? 
A huge piece of feeling better is not feeling alone. I'll say that again. A huge piece of feeling better is not feeling alone. And this is the work of Diana Fosha in a modality that I adore. And it's one of the alphabet therapies, A, E, D, P. Accelerated. So it's a quicker way of getting to things. Mm -hmm. Experiential, it's in the body. E, A, D, dynamic psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So when we hear stories of stress, they're, they're often actually felt alone. I I'm feeling it. I'm not sharing my stress with you. And it makes me feel better because we can carry the load together. And it's like, well, what if, can I be with you while you feel this? Oh. So I just want to stop there and see how that's landing. What I loved about this so much was the, the feeling that you gave us that I can. So I tell you the story. Yes. <laughs> And feel the story. You tell it and you feel it. Exactly. The here gestures. I tell you the story. You ride the wave with me. I feel how the fear leaves me because you're there. You're kind of processing this with me. But then I leave the office. And so the fear comes back and I have to deal with this by myself. And so what I loved about your your uh, the comment here was that if I... Like if the fear comes back or I'm again in this stressful situation with my boss or my partner or something like this, I can imagine that you are, you are there with me. That the part of the work is also imaginary in a way. That's so right. And imagination, as you and I both know, as everybody who might be listening, our imaginations can either work for us or not for us, right? When we see a spooky movie, we can be so scared our imagination, I mean, it feels real and it's not real. And if we could imagine when we're scared, you're right, when we're stressed out in that moment again, oh my gosh, she's right next to me. Oh, and right, she told me to wiggle my toes. Oh, and she told me to just say hello to it so that I don't have to like know what it is, but like, right, I'm just feeling like pressure on my chest. Hello, pressure on my chest. And it's helping me stay connected with me. Mm. That I don't float away I don't. in a big stress cloud. <laughs> I don't float away into a big... Lorlin, I have to ask one more comment about this. Your comment. I have to ask one more question about your comment. So you said it is very... A huge part of feeling better is not not doing it alone or not being alone or something like this but let's assume that the, the the person who watches this video says but Lori lynn that's precisely my problem actually i have problems with emotional like codependency or dependency i i, I have these lines these attachments with people that in myself i know they're not actually healthy attachments but i have them and so my problem is the the opposite is to actually well, yes, I let you, I let you continue. What do I that's, do? That's such a great point. So we're talking about something slightly different. And I love what you're raising here because I'm guessing we can all relate to what you just brought up. I, I just want to say that. Oh, it, that's very important. That's in itself very important because the ones who have, uh, for example, I point the finger at me, myself, uh, the ones of us who have this kind of emotional codependency somehow feel like, oh, but I'm the, why well, shouldn't that is a bad thing? And so I, I just, I feel a great relief of stress by just hearing you say that it's a big thing that other people have it too. <laughs> and now feel that in your body, right? That's not a story. Good. Wow. And I meant it. I don't raise my hand and say me too, if I don't mean it. So you felt that, I think. Yeah. Okay. So the weight off. <laughs> there's attachment that is healthy and secure, and there's attachment 
that might not be. That might be anxious attachment or disorganized attachment or all kinds of attachment styles, right? Attachment tendencies. Yes, yeah, so or addictions of all kinds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the one that I'm referring to, of course, and I, I thought you were going to go one way, but, and I'll share that in a second. Well, I thought you were going to say, but Lori Lynn, not all of us are in therapy. And that's, that's another way of, of, of looking at this, but to answer your question first, well, if we know that the thing we do, it's like that beautiful definition of insanity. If I keep running it up and slamming into the wall and hurting myself, and then I stand up and I brush myself off and I walk back again and I run to the wall and I smell, oh boy, keep doing something again and again, expecting something different. Could I do something different in where in my life do I have an attachment that is not codependent? Because I'm guessing that any of us who have had codependent attachments, not every relationship is. And so I would say to you, ah, that person, what would it be like to be with your stress with that person who you don't have that kind of attachment with? Does, does that help? I imagine a different kind of dynamic I, or a different kind of existing dynamic. It's not imaginary, it's real. Also. It's mm -hmm. real, it's a different dance. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the one that might be too broad for the scope of this conversation, but really the beautiful um, duet is the dance between any feeling part that might feel like it's taking us over. Yes. And really what we need to do when that happens is, oh, it's only a part of us. It's really not all of us. And if we could imagine, like I have a core self, it's like the core me that's at the head of the table and it's not, parental and it's not dictating and it's not the know-it-all. It's just the head of the table that's going, hi, all parts of me. I'm here to hear you and see you and know you. And if I can do that, that's really the beginning of the healthiest relationship we can ever have. Because then it's with me and me. Yes. Then I'm always there. Lorelin, this is wonderful. I ask you now this. We were talking about how you approach uh, stress and emotions of different kinds of physical sensations when you work with the clients in your psychotherapy sessions. But how does it work out when you teach dance? So somebody comes to you that like, do you find out that the, do they talk about stress and overwhelm? How does it work in your dance practice, this theme of stress and emotions? And tell us. I often, I mean, I have, uh, like I said at the beginning, I've studied so many modalities over the years, and I have three beautiful names for what I offer, and they all might evoke different sensations. So I'll just say them to you first, and then I'll answer your question more directly. I have something that I like to call soul moves, and that could be S-O-L-E, meaning the feet, the soles of the feet or S-O-U-L, mm -hmm. I have dance yourself free and I have the body knows. So these are all things that I've done with a blending of the worlds of psychotherapy and movement or dance. Mm -hmm. And so you ask, okay, somebody comes into a, a class. Well, I always have a, an opening circle where I actually invite a lot. I feel like I bring vulnerability. I know in uh, the beautiful interview you did, I believe it was with Maria, mm -hmm. we talked about vulnerability. I might bring something up and how do I do that? It's not a therapy, it's not a group therapy, but I might say, tell me your name and something you want the rest of us to know about you. Mm -hmm. 
And somebody the other day said, this weekend, I think I got over my fear of heights. Something that we would have never known. Somebody else said her name and said, stress, this is what made me think of you and me. She said, stress always finds me at this time of year. It's the end of the school year. She's a teacher. And she said, I would think that I would feel less stressed and stress just finds me. So I thought, okay. And I don't, it's not therapy. So I don't really say much, but I thank. And then before we begin, as we've all introduced ourselves and maybe said this thing, and I come up with something different every time, I listen and I watch with eyes on all the sides of my head so that I don't feel like I'm, but I might see somebody who's stressed, who might be ahead of the beat, or might look foggy or not really in their bodies. And look, I'm not here to tell anybody how to move. I'm here in my class to see how do you need to move today in a way that aligns with where you are and how you want to feel. Now, chances are people might want to feel better if they feel foggy and stressed. So I might say, passing that person with my eyeballs and my dance. Ah, and what if we all took a moment to hear the music, but move in slow motion? Hmm. So the world or the music might be doing or feeling like this. And what if I can which leads into stress, it leads us into the conversation of stress and this notion of pausing. Yes. Um, so I'm watching and I'm discovering, right? It's not what I say that's magical. It's does it land and have an effect? Mm. And earlier you said also that you work with emotions that you have... Uh... Do you want to say more about emotions also? Like In how, class? Yes. How do I connect to my emotions when I come to your dance class? How do I? So I might often, if it's a class that is a, a typical follow the leader and it's more choreographed, this doesn't happen as much, but I typically sneak in at least one or two songs that there's no follow the leader. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily have to be like, you know, the depth of an emotion. It doesn't have to go super deep. And I've often talked, I often in classes will talk about the pool. Do you want to splash with me in the shallow end of the pool of emotion? Or do you want to come to the middle where maybe the water's up to your heart? Or do you want to tread over here in the deep end of whatever it is that this artist singing voice is making you feel right now. And then I watch. Now I can't always tell what's happening, but if I see that somebody's feeling a lot and it might be out of their, what looks like out of their window of tolerance, mm -hmm. but I'll keep people here because this is where we don't float away. Yeah. It seems outside of that, I might say, stuff that we've learned and that we used way back when, when we danced together, um, turn the volume down. Dance with that emotion from across the room, put it in a chair and wave to it and say, hi, let's call it sadness. I see you and I know you're there and we're dancing together, but I need a little distance. What's that face? I love this image. <laughs> because to me, it's like sadness is always like right next next to me on this chair next to me. And so I was imagining this. I was like, oh, but that feels again. It feels so good to just imagine that the sadness is not, not sitting next to me, but it's on the other side of Paris. On the other side of Paris, on another continent, on another, right across the ocean. Oh, it's not like it's it doesn't belong. It's not like, uh, but it's just, there's a lot of distance between us. 
There's a lot of space. That's right. That Seems like that helps. That feels very good. Lauren, and tell us about how you how you handle while well, stressed, or maybe there's another word that you want to use for this. What are your personal mm. Well, I mean, I, I love being super authentic and honest. And as much as I love talking about the work and the play that I love, I got nervous before our interview. You and did. Part- I was going to ask you if you're stressed. Oh. And, or maybe I'm not going to ask you. I'm not now. Mm-hmm. The minute we started talking, you're, I felt I wasn't alone. And I could feel our connection that goes way back in time and is right here in the now. I felt my feet. I also said hello to my feelings. And I said, you don't do an interview every day of the week. It's okay to be stressed, nervous, anxious, scared. I'm not going to make sense. Is this going to be of use? Oh, I hope so, but I don't know. Ooh, and I felt it in my body. So I do all the things that I help other people to do, whether it's in class or in my psychotherapy office. I also have my own therapist. I have my own supervisor who helps me with my psychotherapy people, my clients. I have dear friends where I can go to these places with them and they know me really well. Um, I rely on my playfulness. Play and humor and not taking myself so seriously. Now that doesn't mean that if there's a real feeling, I don't wanna laugh it off. I don't wanna laugh it away. But if I can playfully move with it, I might not sink into it or drown. Like like we just did the, I'm gonna dance with you from across the room and I'll see you there. And we might be talking about grief, but it's like, I'm over here and you're over there. And we're learning about each other and we're we're developing a relationship, but the only way that I can really get to know you is if I'm not drowning in you. Now, that's nice. That's a good point for everybody to think about their relationships also. Yeah, yeah. Personal relationships also, I think it's very important too. That's right. And one of the other, I mean, I've talked about it, right? As I've talked about, my own therapy or my friendships or playfulness. There's something beautiful about, and and I'm going to reiterate, but I just want to say it differently, a little differently, leaning on somebody. I've, I'm the kind of person that from the time I was very little, I was like a tiny little grown up. You know, I, I was an emotional caretaker and I, big surprise, the profession that I'm now in, right? I mean, no shocker. But I've also always been very silly. And if I can be in relationship with somebody with what I'm feeling, let's say when I'm really stressed or nervous or afraid or angry, if I can be with that while with somebody else, So that's the key, right? Okay, let me tell you what I mean. No, I'm totally with it. I'm with it. I can feel it. uh, uh, uh. Often that's me sinking or drowning. I become it. Oh, yes. Yes. Can I get an amen? I feel you, girl. So can I feel it? Oh, it's right there in my heart while I'm staying connected with you. It's one of the key elements of what I mentioned earlier, AEDP. Stay with your experience while you stay with me. Mm -hmm. It's a way of regulating. Then it's not too loud and it didn't run away. But again, it's somewhere in that window of what I can tolerate, right? I can feel myself, I can feel my feeling 
and I'm staying connected with you in the moment. Not an easy task, but possible. Mm. One of the one of the comments that was very touching to me when we were emailing about this interview and everything, and you mentioned that you want to tell to the listeners, you somehow highlighted this uh, phrase of not being alone. Uh, Do you want to say more about this? And also, <clears throat> for example, in France, in New York, a lot of us also, we live alone. So it's actually one of our biggest, uh, uh, what's the word? Like we want this closeness of somebody, but we don't. So there's nobody naturally around. So we have to go to friends and da -da 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 -da. So a lot of times, and I love that you brought up different qualities really, right? Some of us feel less alone when we go out to get a coffee. Mm -hmm. Just want to make contact. We just want to eyeballs to eyeballs. We just want to, you know, have a moment with that person who's blending our coffee. And that helps us bolster and, you know, helps us go forward for another hour. Yes. For somebody else, it, that might not do it. It might be, I oh, don't know, no, I got to meet that friend for coffee. Yeah. And I, I want to jump into the deep end and, and hang out there for a while. And that helps me feel close or helps me not feel alone. Yes. So how do we, and here's the three words that I adore that again come from not my, my brain and my creation, but I use this in my movements, my movement classes and in my therapy sessions. How do we undo unbearable aloneness? So I feel in my body and being that I thrive when I don't feel so isolated and alone. To your point, when I'm actually alone, what do I do? What helps me feel connected? For somebody, it might be laughing at really funny cat videos on Instagram. For somebody else, it might be, I don't have a friend in sight. So I'm going to pick up the phone and do that thing that we just don't do anymore, which is talk, right? I need to see their face. I'm going to FaceTime somebody. And I think that I, I'll speak for myself. I often don't do it because, oh, I don't have an hour free. Well, do I have five minutes? That touch in where it's like, hi, I see you. It happened the second you and I signed on. We haven't seen each other. I'll speak for myself in real time in a long time. Mm -hmm. And I felt so... I felt so much love, like from you and for you. I felt immediate connection. I felt, I felt that like my stress and my fear started to fall away. I didn't have to let it go. It just transformed into something else. So it's the effort. It's the making the effort to not feel so alone. Yeah, but I journal. Yeah, but I love listening to music on my own. And I've got my cat. That's fantastic. All those things are fabulous. And if they do the trick, the body knows. We'll feel better. But if they don't do the trick, we might need to turn up the volume on contact. That's very beautiful. I loved also the different the different ways in which you said we might feel nourished by by contact. I remember when I was living in New York, I really loved the, um, the impact that this kind of social glue of uh, going to a coffee shop, feeling like I can have this, this conversation, this little conversation with the person there, like he knows, she knows that I'm there every day. Da, da, da. I felt really supported by these 
what to some people might feel like superficial connections, but they were not superficial at all. Like those were the people that on a daily basis saw me and supported me. And, and now that I live, I've lived in different cultures, I see that I also cannot take it for granted that different cultures have a very different way of handling these, uh, these social interactions. Yeah. So I love that also. Now, Laurelyn, do you want to, do you have any, any final advice, any tips, or I think you also had maybe an exercise that you wanted to share with us. I think we've done it together. Oh, we did already. If, I, I, think, I mean, we can do something a little more explicitly, but from what I gathered as we were talking and you were saying, wait, 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 I'm not sure I understand that. Um, really, it's about When somebody's going, when I, I'll speak for myself, when I'm going really fast, what can I do to slow down a little bit? Because I'm a great multitasker. You know, I look like a crazy juggler. You know, I can make the bed and brush my teeth and da, 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 but, da, but I'm, I'm, I'm everywhere and nowhere. And it's like, well, what if I just did one thing at a time? In other words, the slower I go, the faster I get there. And that's, that's really the truth. Because if I'm speedy, stressed, anxious, and scared, and I'm looping, right? That's the other thing that stress does. It just keeps telling the same story. And so something you asked me to mention is slowing down. And you brought up the wonderful point. Well, what if we don't have jobs or lives that allow that? Mm -hmm. And I thought of, you know, somebody working on the stock exchange or somebody, some kind of very fast paced. And even within anything that's that, We have a moment to wiggle our toes. We have a moment to come up with an internal words that feel kind of yummy on the inside. Sometimes I can't stand the phrase calm down. I want to scream when somebody tells me to calm down. <laughs> so what that might work for you. Mm -hmm. For me, sounds sometimes work. So internally, I might say, ah, oh. or something. I mean, I walk down the street humming and I don't mean humming a tune. I mean, just audibly exhaling. Mm. It's those paraverbals that we do with really little babies to soothe. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need a lot of words. It might be slower. The fastest paced job needs focus and concentration and pacing. And so I think what I wanted to just name is no matter what our age or what our profession or we all feel stress. And one of the things that stress loves is going fast. Stress, I guarantee, will stay at a fever pitch if we keep going fast. Because it will always find, oh, and another thing. Oh, and there's that other thing that I, oh my gosh, and this other thing stressed me out yesterday. And just this morning, this, oh, and I, I want to hear every word. But what if you just tell me just even a tiny bit slower? So I think as a culture, you know, I, I as I was listening to your other beautiful uh, interview on meditation, I was like, oh, I wish I was a meditator. I don't meditate. But I think I do just in my own way. Oh, I'm so happy to feel your nod. Yes, no, I totally do. I totally think you do. Uh, you have your own way, movement also maybe. 
at least some portions of movement uh, meditation too. You know, as I was listening to you, I also, this idea of slowing down, and I was thinking also about the, the way in which we approach movement in... So here we are, we are very used to these somatic and therapeutic practices, but I think a lot of people also practice movement practices that are actually very stressful also for the nervous system and for the body also. That I are learn fast. it. I learn this. Can I pick it up? Can I? Yeah, so that are fast, the music is loud, the... Um, it is actually a stressful experience for the for the entire system. And here's the thing. And again, just like I don't believe one size fits all. Yeah. Maybe it stresses you out and maybe it stresses me out. True. And maybe for that person, the louder the better. I love learning these things and like it I keep messing up and then when I get it it's like, yes. It might be a remedy to their stress. Exactly. That's true. And you know, that is a very important point. Just telling to those people who are like us, who are currently <laughs> doing other kinds of things where they feel stressed out, you can come to <laughs> their options also, options uh, for movement practices too. And it's interesting to think about whether movement practices very explicitly address stress also, because for example, I know that in Kundalini, for example, they do one certain kind of movement with certain kind of breathing for 11 minutes or so. And the idea is also to actually to, in a way, through movement to stress you out, to to make you go beyond what you think is, is capable so that you can have stronger nerves so that, for example, you sit in a squat uh, and you just stay there in an isometric hold. And the idea, again, is to like prepare you uh, for stressful tasks outside of the movement practice. I don't know if you have any comments about that. Physical muscles, emotional muscles. Mm -hmm. You brought up a wonderful question earlier uh, asking, well, what if I'm met with resistance? Mm -hmm. I don't push that resistance over. I, I want to meet it. It's like, hello. Okay, so 10 pounds, emotional 10 pound weight is too much. How about five? So mm -hmm. it's this thing. It's like, oh, if, if that feeling is too intense, and you put it at a distance. Can we come back to the shallow end of the pool? Can we, it's the same thing, developing muscle. That is so beautiful also because, you know, with the dumbbells, I can understand this very clear, clearly. Three pound dumbbells, five, seven, eight. And so I've never really thought about the idea that with the emotions, because I think a lot of us feel like emotions just come to us but you're saying, no, wait a second, to, to process emotions or to deal with emotions, you can also, you have a choice. You can choose yeah. someone, whether you take a heavier emotional dumbbell or a lighter dumbbell, maybe. Yeah. It puts that. us in the driver's seat of our feelings as opposed to our feelings having us. Yes. Same thing with stress. I think we, we to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Are we drowning in stress or are we facing it and listening to it and learning from it and allowing it to feel like we're paying attention so that it can transform into something else. I love how this discussion ended up being about stress and emotions. I already feel like I, there's another discussion we need to have. I, I have an idea. We'll talk about this later. Lori Lynn, is there anything that you want to add? There's a question I didn't ask you or anything else that you want to share? So I'm going into my body, giving my brain a rest. I do want to share something and it, I thought I was going to start with it and it just popped back up again. I just want to say one little thing about the work you're doing. I took my time and I wasn't able to watch every interview in their entirety, but I watched and listened and experienced a lot of what you have done up till now. And I'm here to tell anybody who's listening, please check these videos out. They're really, really, we're converging. We're all uh, meeting at this beautiful table and we all offer something a little bit different. So it's dimensional and like, oh, I've heard this before. This helps me strengthen it. So I just wanted to thank you for the work you're doing. 
You're welcome. Thank you. I take this in. I'm learning how to receive. So I'm taking I'm taking a moment to take this in also because when I watch some of my interviews, I feel like some people say good things at the end and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, let me, let me receive this also. Yes. Thank you. Lori, then how can people find you? Do you do you oh very to... easily? Yes. It's my name without any spaces. Lorilynmeter.com. Lori Lynn. I forgot to, like, where are you? So people can find oh. you physically also. Where do That's you, a, I mean, I know where she lives, but. <laughs> I'm actually in uh, New York's Hudson Valley. So I now live about 90 miles north of the city and it's in the beautiful, what they call the Gunk Mountain Range. And I have a stream as a backyard and it's just, yeah, it's really beautiful up here. And I still have an office in New York City and I practice, you can dance with me online. And if you're not sure it works, give it a try before you say it doesn't work. Do you and give I, in person classes also? In person moments? I, have, I share a class with my dear friend Jane, who you know, I believe. Jane, Jane Michael? On Saturday mornings at 11. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, so wonderful. So you can find uh, Lori Lynn for movement, for psychotherapy, for grief, for eating disorders, for many, many different things. And so be in touch. Yes, thank you so much again, Lori Lynn. And thank you all of you for, for being here and then listening. Oh, thank See you. you.